Welcome, everyone. Very nice to welcome you from all over the world. Before we start, I'd like to inform you that this event is being recorded and parts of it will be made public. Uh, my name is John LeBlanc. I'm a pediatrician at the IWK Health Centre here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, and also an associate professor of pediatrics. And I'm also the uh, Canadian co-principal investigator of one of the projects that we will be discussing today. And it'll be my pleasure to be your MC for today. Um, I'm joining you here from Halifax, and I therefore want to respectfully acknowledge that I'm in the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, we are joining from many places around the world where traditional owners and caretakers have not been sufficiently acknowledged. So since this is a virtual event, I would encourage you to think about the land that you are on and its people's past and present. Since this is, um, uh, we are co-hosting this event with the management team of the Innovating for Maternal and Child Health in Africa initiative. This is funded by the International Development Research Center, the Canadian Institutes of Child uh, um, uh, of Health Research and Global Affairs Canada. And this has been a, uh, an endeavor from 2014 to the present year. Um, I would now like to introduce Francine, who is going to provide some IT instructions as well as the agenda. So Francine. Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. My name is Francine Sinzenkayo, and I'll be helping moderate questions today. A couple of housekeeping notes as we get started. So the event is taking place in both English and French, and you are welcome to participate in any of those languages. You can change your audio settings at the top of your screen. And I'm going to repeat this message in French to ensure we are all on the same page. Donc cet événement se déroule en français et en anglais. Veuillez participer. So this event will occur in French and English. Please take part in the language of your choice, either French or English. You can change your settings at the top of your window. Slides, however, that will be posted during the presentations will only be in English. In the discussions, at the top of your screen, there is a Slido button. Slido opens in a pop-up window, allowing you to see both the presenters and the Slido box. This box has two tabs, a question and answer, and a poll tab. Send us questions at any time during the event via the Q&A section. And please note that you can vote on questions that you would like to see answered by clicking on the thumbs up icon. And you can also go to slido.com and enter the event code 2549 to participate. For technical support, click on the question mark at the top of your screen and we'll be there to assist you. If you get disconnected for any reasons, you can always rejoin by clicking on the same link. And finally, we are inviting you to use our hashtag Imsha Mekdoning when tweeting about the event. Let's go over the agenda together now. So we start with opening remarks followed by presentations that dive into how strengthening human resources at both clinical and administrative levels can improve the quality of health, health services in Canada and in Africa. The panelists will then take questions and please note that questions can only be typed and sent via Slido. When possible, tell us who you, whom you are directing your questions to. We then break into discussion groups to share experiences and knowledge, after which We'll come back in plenary to hear highlights from the different discussion groups and then we move into our closing remarks. Again, at any time, send us questions via the slide question and answers section. Thank you and over to you, John. All right, thanks Francine. Now let's see what our responses to the Slido questions were. So I hope everyone has had a chance to click and we'd love to know where you're from and uh, what your experience is, your interest in this. Um, first of all, with, with respect to the country, so I'm looking now at the poll. I've only seen three countries appear and I know there are more. So people use your, your um, Slido window in your um, browser and uh, please answer. I did review the registration uh, database. Lots of people registered, about 150 as of last night. Um, and I was amazed to see people from all over the world. Um, uh, many African countries, um, as well as um, uh, countries in Asia and South America, and of course some some people from the states and and uh, the UK and so forth. Um, I now see that we've moved to our next question, so that we we didn't get too much of a poll for the number of countries, but I know we are well represented. Now this next question is selecting the group with whom you most identify, 
And so 67% are uh, funders, 22% are researchers, 11% are uh, other, and those are the, the major categories. Uh, the next one, have you ever been involved in an IMSA project? And for that, 56% yes. So there are 44% of people for whom I hope this is a great education for you. All right, so in one word, what does health system strengthening to improve maternal and child health mean to you? And you can answer as many times as you want. So quality, justice, security, bring health to people. We'll wait for a few more responses. Okay, so that's, uh, it's very nice to hear the, the um, variety of people that are here, the countries, and now I think we need to move on to our um, uh, uh, introductory, our uh, plenary speakers. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you our first esteemed speaker, um, His Excellency Dr. Mpupi Uli Subisya, uh, who is the High Commissioner of Tanzania to Canada. Um, Dr. Ulisibisia is an anesthesiologist and critical care physician with 20 years of experience in Tanzania. And prior to his current assignment, he was the permanent secretary of health for the country. That's uh, um, for those not familiar with more of the UK system um, and the system in many African countries, that's similar to being a deputy minister. So a very important position indeed in terms of directing how the health system unfold. So at this point, I would like to turn it to you, uh, Your Excellency. Well, thank you very much, John. I thank the organizers for the privilege that they've accorded me to speak a little bit to this esteemed audience. Uh, the title is quite uh, heartwarming. Making the links in Canada and Africa, health system strengthening to improve maternal and child health. Just as John said during the introduction, this work would not have been complete had it not been for the support that um, the whole project has received from the government of Canada through the institutions that he had mentioned at the beginning in trying to help the case that is before us in Sub-Saharan Africa. The universities bring a very, very significant contribution because they answer questions that are usually often ignored. And this whole plan I see is founded on uh, what the United Nations identified as major global health challenges as outlined in the United Nations Strategic Development Goals and specifically maternal and child health. Because of the role that this plays in the health and um, progress of the people, in the year 2019, the World Health Organization published a report Sadly, in that particular year, it was indicated that annually about 300,000 women died of complications that resulted from pregnancy and childbirth. In 2016, a similar report indicated that maternal mortality was the second leading cause of women in the reproductive age. In the Sub-Saharan Africa, that contributed to about 65% of maternal deaths. Uh, health system strengthening is uh, a broad topic. The six building blocks that I'll be enumerating in a moment are crucial that they are all addressed if results are to be realized. Looking at human resource for health alone and health governance would leave out things like service delivery, information systems, health commodities, health financing, and when those are not part to the game, the end results are not going to be what we expect. I want to believe that in the course of this call, discussants and those who will be uh, uh, listening will address among other things, the few that I want to mention. Number one, strategies for addressing known causes and factors for these deaths that uh, are, so, are so serious a problem in our setup. The implementation of effective interventions across the board that will help us address the, this, this curse, I would say, to the human race. Replicate, strengthen, and make linkages to mobilize resources that will address the knowledge gap 
but also supply of health commodities in addressing this particular challenge. Then we see how together we can implement these interventions effectively to reduce deaths of women and children in sub-Saharan Africa. I want to believe that at the end of this conference, we would not have uh, spent time trying to reinvent another wheel, but together and collectively in a timely fashion, we shall have just realigned the wheels that are known because we know when these are put in place appropriately, the results are known to be improved outcome in health services delivery and whose eventual outcome will be a reduction in maternal child health. Thank you very much and allow me to wish you fruitful discussion as you continue to deliberate and exchange knowledge uh, in, in, in the course of this conference. God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elisabia. Those are excellent comments and a good reminder of the building blocks in the World Health Organization and, and for setting the stage for us. Um, uh, you're most welcome to stay for as long as you can. I know your life is busy. Uh, next, I would like to turn this over to um, Dr. Annette Elliott-Rose. She's the Vice President and, and Clinical Care Chief Nursing Executive at the IWK Health Center. Um, Dr. Rose has a long-standing interest in uh, global health and in also health reaching marginalized populations. And that's actually part of the mandate of the IWK Health Center as well. So Dr. Rose, I give you the floor. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, as I know there are many uh, participants online today who are from many parts of the world. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit first about the pandemic, but then really move into uh, to, to wider work that's been happening around maternal newborn health for, for a long, long time. So we know the pandemic continues to have a profound impact on maternal newborn health. And there have been and continue to be disruptions in, in things like routine immunizations, family planning, perinatal services. And there's been some rollout of the COVID vaccine uh, for pregnant women, but we know there's very little data uh, clinically around that and no viable COVID vaccine currently for children. So there are some clinical studies underway. Um, due to the pandemic, we see globally that at least 40 million children worldwide have missed out on some early education 150 million additional children are in poverty, and there have been 7 million unintended pregnancies that have occurred over the course of the pandemic due to lockdowns and disrupt disruptions in services. And, and although the pandemic has exacerbated these issues and, and highlighted areas for improvement, advocacy, and change, many of these issues are not new. And work to re respond to these are why we continue to work together as global partners to advance the care uh, of women and children. So as the world continues to address uh, the devastating impact of COVID-19, we must also continue to work together to safeguard decades of progress on maternal child health and well-being. And we know through the Sustainable Development Goals that were just mentioned and, and other initiatives that we're, there's lots of good work on this and much to do. So we continue to keep focused on successes and challenges globally and locally. Uh, here at the IWK, we're using the Every Woman, Every Child report to consider indicators that not only measure improvements in health services, but also consider a wider definition of health, inclusive of the social determinants, the need for continued advocacy, and a call to action, really to transform systems and societies. When we explored the goals in Every Woman, Every, Every Child, and also looking at the UNICEF reports, Canada actually doesn't rank well. We ranked overall 25th out of, out of 41 high-income countries. And in goal one, which was focused on ending uh, poverty, Canada ranked 32nd. In goal two, which focuses on food security and hunger, we ranked 37th. And we also ranked 37th when we looked at goal 16, focused on promoting peaceful and inclusive societies. So we know we have much to learn and we have much work to do to change services and systems to improve the health and well being of mothers and children. So, our ongoing global partnerships and the marvelous work that's going to be showcased today, and I have the good fortune of being a co moderator for one of the sessions, it's really part of recognizing inequities injustices, taking action, and transforming systems. We continue to learn with and from our colleagues in Africa and from all over the world. 
And we admire your innovation, your ingenuity, your resilience and fortitude. And we so value your partnerships to advance maternal and newborn health. I'm really looking forward uh, to the next few hours to, to learn more about these exciting projects and initiatives. So thank you. Thank you so much, Fanette. That was a, that was a great overview. And, and I think so important for you to stress the links between what we can uh, learn from our African colleagues and hopefully what they can learn from us so that this really is a two-way street. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Montessar Kamal, who's the program leader of the Health Research Partnership at the International Development Research Center, um, and a very important um, a voice in uh, directing how these programs unfold that uh, uh, are of benefit to us in Canada and to you in Africa. So, Dr. Kamal. Thank you so much, uh, John, um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm joining you today from Ottawa, Canada, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land where I live and work is the traditional and unceded Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe territory. Um, IDRC honors the peoples and lands of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation and honors the Old First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. It's my pleasure to, uh, to be part of uh, this welcoming uh, panel uh, to this event on behalf of the Innovating for Maternal and Child Health in Africa initiative. 98% um, um, of maternal deaths are preventable and a large portion of children's deaths are also preventable. Most of these deaths, unfortunately and sadly, take place in LMICs in low and middle income countries. All women and children, regardless of where they live, how, uh, how old they are, whether they are married or not, and, uh, or how much income they have, deserve access to respectful and high quality health services here in Canada, as well as in the rest of the world. Yet this reality is, the reality is that women and children, particularly those from vulnerable and disadvantaged populations, uh, have the worst access to quality care and health outcomes. Uh, in Canada, for example, Indigenous women have doubled the maternal mortality rate um, where, when compared to non-Indigenous women. So as part of Canada's commitment to gender equality and maternal and child health, three Canadian government agencies, uh, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, Global Affairs Canada, and International Development Research Centre, where I worked, launched the Innovating for Maternal and Child Health in Africa initiative in 2014. It is a partnership between <clears throat> uh, African and Canadian uh, Canad Africans and Canadians. Each of the research teams is led by an African principal investigator working in collaboration with a Canadian researcher, co-principal investigator, and an African decision maker called uh, co-principal investigator. You know, through this work, Incha has supported 19 research teams working in 11 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and two regional uh, organizations, one in East Africa and one in, in West Africa. Together, these researchers and research teams have generated research evidence to inform policies and, uh, and practices to improve maternal and child health. Today, we will dive into the work on the health system, strengthening to exchange experience and lessons learned. MSHA teams engage, on, uh, engage the health system in different ways in different countries with primary health care as the entry point. Some teams tested ways to improve the quality of care provided at the health facility level, Others uh, work at improving, uh, uh, improving communication and collaboration between health facility and the community. Other teams tested the use of mobile phones, for example, um, to provide more reliable and timely data to health providers for, be for better monitoring of pregnant women in remote areas. Others explored how national policies were implemented and could be more impactful. And many more innovative approaches and examples uh, that were tested uh, by researchers, by African and Canadian researchers. Um, and great results are coming out of this work and we hope you will be joining us in this and other, uh, continue to join us in this and future events to learn more about those results. Today, we reflect on how we can uh, learn from many more uh, such experiences from Sub-Saharan Africa, Canada and beyond on how to support the health systems to improve maternal and child health and sexual and reproductive health. 
for MCHA and IDRC, this type of learning exchange is important. And I have no doubt today's event will be fruitful, um, hopefully for all of our audience today. On behalf of the MCHA partners, uh, IDRC, the Canadian Institute for Health Research and Global Affairs Canada, I welcome you to this webinar and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Back to you, John. Thank you for your excellent uh, remarks, Matasera, and giving us that broad overview, which is uh, very, very helpful. Next, I would like to turn to Dr. Christine Chambers. Um, uh, Christine is the Scientific Director of the um, uh, Institute of Human Development, Child and Youth Health from the Canadian Institutes of Child, uh, Child Health Research. And Christine, as well, is a, a well-known, internationally known researcher in pain um, uh, research. So uh, we're very happy to have her here at the IWK. And, and Christine, the, chores, the floor is yours. Hello, thank, hello everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me today to share a few opening remarks. The Canadian Institutes of Health Research is proud to be a funding partner on the Innovating for Maternal and Child Health in Africa initiative alongside the IDRC and Global Affairs Canada with whom we've had valuable, long-standing and productive partnerships. The MCHA research teams have done wide-reaching and innovative work with community and policy partners to generate knowledge, scale up research results to impact policy, and build successful, equitable, and mutually beneficial African-Canadian research collaborations. As we know, health policies and systems and programs do not improve automatically just because sound evidence is available. It is therefore particularly inspiring to learn about the successful partnerships within this initiative that have led to the uptake of evidence into practice and have provided excellent examples of knowledge mobilization in action, which is something that I'm particularly passionate about. I look forward to hearing more about this work during the event. At CIHR, we have just launched a new 10-year strategic plan that prioritizes the pursuit of equity by championing research on inequitable health outcomes, access to healthcare, and the determinants of health. An important emphasis is driving progress on global health research as we live in an interdependent world where our health is shaped by circumstances beyond our national borders. The CIHR framework for action on global health research that will soon be launched will mobilize Canadian research excellence to accelerate health equity the implementation of this will include support for global health initiatives that will continue to promote a culture of collaboration in the international research environment and contribute to high quality, timely and impactful health research worldwide. Today, I'm very excited by the opportunity to learn from African and Canadian experts and their experiences addressing important knowledge gaps and strengthening health, health systems. I'd like to thank IDRC and Dalhousie University for organizing this great event, and I look forward to the presentations and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and make sure you use your voice to make sure that global health is a major part of CIHR's mandate. I think this audience will certainly appreciate that. Uh, next, we will turn to our, uh, we are now going to have four presentations, um, uh, 10 minutes each, followed by a question and answer period. The first will be by Dr. Linda Nyondo uh, Mepando. Dr. Nyondo Mepando is the health systems researcher and faculty member of the Department of Health Systems and Policy at the College of Medicine in Malawi. She also serves as the Deputy Dean of Academics at the School of Public Health and Family Medicine. Her presentation will focus on delivering integrated health services for neonates. And this work was carried out or, by an IMCHA team in Malawi. Uh, Dr. Nyondo Mapando, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. So greetings from Malawi. Um, am I going to have my slides up? All right, thank you. My talk is on delivery, delivering integrated health services for neonates. These are some of the lessons we learned from our INCHA funded project, uh, which, which took place in Malawi. Next, uh, next slide. So that slide just basically wanting to present the statistics for Malawi, I'll draw you to the last uh, row that shows the neonatal mortality rate for Malawi, which is about 20 out of a thousand births. Next slide. 
uh, this is where it gets exciting. So I've decided to put our integration in terms of like different aspects within the health system. So started looking at service delivery integration at all levels. So asking ourselves to say, what is the actual like services? What, how are they like and what should they be like? So the argument we're making from our IMCHA work is that they shouldn't be programmatic. By programmatic, I'm saying shouldn't have a, a, a service that's purely for kangaroo mother care or that's just looking at bubble steep up or just looking at breastfeeding support. But let's make it into a package so that at least you've got a whole package for a neonate that can be delivered at different levels. And by different levels, I mean like primary care <clears throat> as well as secondary care, as well as uh, tertiary, uh, tertiary level care. And these three levels are going to be different because they're, they're going to have different resources. So it needs to be, even though they're going to be services that are contextualized, that are integrated, they have to be contextualized to the setting where they are at. And this was evident in one of our papers that showed that what happens at the tertiary level cannot be just plucked out and be, 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 be put at a, at a district level. We have to contextualize at that level. Another, another aspect is that if you don't integrate the services, you end up having neglected units. Like we saw that the Kangaroo Mother Care Award was a neglected ward because people would say, oh, okay, they, the units are fine. Let's just concentrate maybe on the labor ward or other, or other services or the, where the sick ones are, are at. But if you integrate them, then the Kangaroo Mother Care Award would not be a neglected ward. Another aspect would be about integration would be to ask actually biomedical engineers to, to be part of the ward rounds that happen so that you're delivering care that's looking at your nursing team, your medical officers team, as well as the biomedical engineers to look at this, the equipment that is actually there and be able to serve this right there and then. Um, I thought that uh, to, do, to be able to do this, the normalization concept or framework could be in use whereby you achieve coherence of, of of that and then be able to, to reflect upon it and be able to integrate into the service. That other picture is just showing that we need to strive to a point where by the new unit is at the center and then we're looking at all the facets that surround a new unit for us to be able to integrate appropriately. Next slide. The next level of integration would be about infrastructure integration. So you, you start to look at where, how are this, where are the services located? Where are they provided? And looking at that, always having in mind the mother-baby pair that you try as much as possible not to separate this. What we found in other instances is that maybe the neonatal ward is far away, not in the same building with where the labor ward is at, or far away from where the, the postnatal ward is at. In that way, even though you're saying we're delivering these services, but as long as there's no infrastructure integration, then there are problems there because you never know what can happen as you're... As you're as you're transferring a, a hypothermic neonet from, from the labor ward to the, to the nursery or the neonatal ICU. So there has to be an infrastructure integration that is going to happen whereby you deliberately think through the belt environment of the neonatal ward, how it's going to look like, where is it going to be positioned? Is it within the same vicinity with all the other important infrastructures or support services that it needs? So that the mother and the baby should be should not be separated too much. And I'm making a case whereby proposing that even within the settings of low middle income countries, whereby maybe we cannot have a mother, uh, women's and children's hospital, but at least within the same setting where where one has a central hospital, one could actually put in a woman and put put the woman and the baby closer to each other within the limited space that is there. That could be doable, and that could save a lot because once you discharge a mother automatically you're also discharging the neonate, which happens most of the times, but you want to keep them close together so that they move together as a, as a pair. And also to have the actual blueprints of what, what does it mean to have a neonatal unit within uh, countries like Malawi, because such, uh, such is not available for our country. And that needs to be, that needs to be thought through and to be, to be an aspect in the integrated services. Next slide. The other aspect of integration uh, would be about resource integration. So you try to put as many resources together because the moment it's programmatic, the resources are also shared according to the programs. But the moment you, it's a package, the resources are going to go a long way across the different programs. So you, you strive for resource integration whereby there's teamwork. And this also cements the point where I talked about having biomedical engineers, because sometimes or many times you find that an equipment has broken down 
And I've actually put in there uh, the Bapo Sipa, the Pumani machine on the on my slide because we, uh, one of our papers looked specifically on the implementation of the of the Bapo Sipa machine. So it also showed that as long as the engineers are not there to give support, the nurses would not know what it means or how to correct or to, to alleviate a problem, which could be a simple thing. Whereas if the, those resources are, are integrated together, it becomes easier and any problem could be rectified there and there and then. Another case we made in our research was on task shifting. So considering the shortages of staff that are, that are persistent in our, in our healthcare services, we've got a resource that we can tap from. This resource could be the lay people within the hospitals that could be, uh, that could be trained maybe to offer kangaroo mother care to support uh, women with breastfeeding so that, they, so that the nurses and the clinical officers or the medical officers are left with the pure clinical work. But and then you just shift the other work to train lay people. And another resource would be the caregivers, because in Malawi, you've got caregivers who are within the hospitals. They stay within the hospitals with the neonate, but sometimes we overlook them, overlook them. But they could be brought into the care and be briefed on what they need to do, whether in terms of kangaroo mother care, in terms of uh, breastfeeding support, even on Bapo Sipa for them to understand, because many times you find that if the nurse is not looking on that particular baby, other mothers would take the baby off, off, off the Bapo Sipa machine. But if they understand the essence of that and they are brought into the care, then the care could be far much better. So you integrate with the, with the caregivers that are there as long as they've been supported. And this has been shown in most of our papers as well that we've done. The last bit about resources is about integrating the, the, the equipment, meaning that as a, as a country need to be able to come to a point whereby we say, okay, we are going to use this brand because that way it helps us. Even if a donor is coming, you tell them, if you want to donate to us, donate us this, donate to us this particular brand, because then we already have the expertise in terms of like repairs and we know where to get the parts of it. And people are already used to that. What has happened so far is that there are so many things that are coming in with different brands. Let's for instance, oxygen concentrators, they would come in different brands. If they break down, nobody knows how to operate them. As such, then there are problems in how to fix them and as, as a result, you've got a you've got a you've got a graveyard of equipment. Not that there's any, not that they are broken severely, but because there's no expertise. So also also integrating of the equipment would help us to be cost efficient because we'd be dealing maybe with the same repair the repairing company, the same kind of uh, spares as well. Thank you very much. That's what I had for you in, on delivering integrated neonatal services in Malawi. Thank you so much. That was really an excellent overview. Um, and we will have a chance to discuss that more. We will have a question and answer period after. Next, I would like to um, uh, invite um, uh, Dr. Um, Oladji. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Is it, uh, Dr. Oladji is a senior lecturer in the College of Medicine at the University of Ibadan. Uh, she's also a consultant psychiatrist at Ibadan University College Hospital and is currently the head of the department. Dr. Oladeji's presentation focuses on new approaches within the health system to integrate maternal health services into primary care. This work has been carried out by an inch team in uh, Nigeria. So Dr. Oladeji, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and um, good afternoon from Nigeria. And I'd like to thank, thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk on behalf of our Incha team in Ibadan, led by the local PI, Professor Oyogureje, and our Canadian PI, Professor Phyllis Zerkowicz. Can I have my slides, please? Thank you. I will be looking at approaches within the health system to introduce community mental health program with a focus on the human resource training and support needs required to integrate mental health services into routine maternal and child health care in a resource constrained setting. I will broadly be looking at what is needed, but all through I will make reference to our experience implementing our intra projects in Nibado. We had the main project, which is the scaling up care for prenatal depression for improved maternal and child health as our spectral project. And we also had a synergy project, which was focused on developing interventions for perinatal depression for adolescents, that is the responding to the challenge of adolescent perinatal depression, the RAPID study. 
Next slide, please. As a background, there is a huge treatment gap for mental disorders globally. And this is much more pronounced for low and middle income countries. Up to 50% of people who need care for a mental health problem do not get it even in high income countries. In low and middle income countries, this figure rises to 85% and more. In Nigeria, for example, only about 10% of people in need for mental health care get any. Next slide, please. A key barrier to accessing services is the lack of human resources. The map um, on this slide shows the figures across low and middle income countries. There were 50, 58 countries included in this survey and um, 51 countries had a um, need for um, mental health resources and the darker green um, con um, countries highlighted in dark green actually have a significant shortage and require at least 20 additional mental health professionals per 100,000 population to meet the needs. Nigeria is currently one of the better resourced um, countries when it comes to available resources for healthcare in Africa. But even at that, the provider to population density is still too low to deliver essential health services. Current estimates put our population in Nigeria to about 200 million and about 35 doctors are currently available for 100,000 of our population. Compare that to 241 in a place like Canada, for example. We have 86 North midwives servicing 100,000 people. And most of these doctors and midwives actually practice in um, hospitals located in urban centers. The primary healthcare system is one that caters across both urban and rural um, settings. And the, um, in that setting, most of the providers are non-physician primary care community health workers. And these frontline providers have their work supervised by the more senior providers. And a primary care physician oversees delivery of service for, for a cluster of eight to 15 clinics. There are about 136 community health workers to 100,000 of the population. And when it comes to um, mental health professionals, we have about one psychiatrist to 400,000 population. So the resources are very scarce. Can we go to the next slide? So in such resource constraint settings, the most efficient way to improve coverage for mental health care generally, and more specifically for maternal mental health, which is the focus of our program, is to adopt some form of task sharing where the available specialists train the frontline providers to provide mental health care. Studies indicate that training is not sufficient, support and supervision is also needed to, um, to make task sharing work. And then um, in our setting, um, up to between um, 8 and 20% of women develop perinatal depression. Most of these women are cared for by these community health workers and um, other providers who do not have the required skills to identify perinatal depression and provide care so that they can reduce these negative consequences on the mother and her baby. So our IMCHA project was focused on how to effectively use the task sharing approach to scale up care for perinatal depression in the context of these human resource constraints. So task sharing will require that these providers are empowered through training and supportive supervision to deliver care. So considering that um, mental health specialists are very few in our setting, we also looked at the fact that the specialists may not be able to provide the necessary training and support for all these frontline providers. So we felt that it might be more feasible to have the usual supervisors do this training and the supportive supervision. So building capacity for us, we looked at building the capacity of the frontline healthcare providers to be able to identify depression, provide interventions, make referral decisions, and keep adequate clinic, clinic records. And we also looked at building the capacity of their usual supervisors to provide them with additional capacity to train the frontline providers and also provide supportive supervision. Next slide, please. So for sustainability, we adopted a cascade training program. So what we did was to first train selected senior primary health care workers and the primary care physicians, and then they now train the frontline providers. So in our training format, we use a combination of um, didactic teaching sessions where, we, where the, this provide, the, the trained providers provided training to the frontline providers in batches of not more than 25 providers per session. And we combined the teaching sessions 
with role plays, we developed case scenarios that were based on our clinical experience of the presentation of prenatal depression in primary care. And the primary care providers took turns to act out these scenarios and how they will provide care for, the, for such patients. So we focused our training on three topical areas, improving clinical competence, which included improving their intervening skills, how to elicit signs and symptoms, and negotiate treatment decisions with the women and their family, and also building a positive attitude towards treating um, depression in the providers, since we know that stigma is the key barrier to help seeking. And then we also help them identify when there was a need for further consultation or referral for the women. So the next slide, please. So from our experience, we can say that the essential ingredients that are needed to successfully integrate care for prenatal depression in routine care included the provision of clinical support tools. Even after training, the primary care providers had some difficulty with identifying women that needed treatment. So when we supplemented this with the use of a brief screening tool, for, we, we chose the patient health, the two item patient health questionnaire, which was very easy for the providers to administer while they were triaging the patient. And that actually helped them to recognize women that needed further clinical assessment. And um, so, we, so that shows that routine screening will be helpful in increasing the ability to identify. Treatment algorithms were also useful as an aid for them to make evidence-based treatment decisions. We adopted the treatment guidelines for prenatal depression in the World Health Organization Mental Health Gap, Gap Action Intervention Guide. And what we did was to build on that and then to put it in a manual that was easy for the frontline providers to understand. Refresher training is also important. We discovered that over time, there was a drift in the knowledge of depression by the frontline providers and also their motivation to continue to provide care for prenatal depression also dwindled. So refresher training was needed to boost their knowledge and to ensure that they continue to deliver care. So we did this like the National Health Information System. When there are no health in, mental health indicators, then the, um, and that means there's no need to report whether the providers are actually seeing people in need of mental health care. Après l'interruption euh, du signal audio, euh, la conférence reprend. Donc, il n'avait pas euh, d'obligation de signaler les cas. In, in closing, I would like to mention the importance of building in monitoring and evaluation into service development. This helps to identify the areas that need improvement and the necessary inputs to optimize service. So for our program, we monitor the knowledge of depression. The figure shows um, the improvements in, um, in, in, in knowledge immediately after training. And then six months down the line, there was this slight drift in the, in the knowledge retained. And then we also monitor the rates of identification of depression. That is what, was, that is, what is shown in the charts, the, the charts below. This improved with different levels of input. So we got better results when we combined screening with supportive supervision. The, um, ability, the ability to identify got up to like 50% when we implemented all that, even though that is not optimal, but at least it's a great improvement over the 1% that they had before training. We also monitor their competence to deliver care with, um, when to provide the interventions. We sat in on sessions and then we helped, we provided them with feedback to improve the skills of um, individual and primary care providers. So in conclusion, it is possible to integrate service for maternal mental health into routine clinical services. And this is more likely to be sustainable where we build the capacity for the existing human resources within the healthcare system. Thank you so much for listening. I would like to acknowledge our funders on, for, for the IMCHA project. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that excellent overview, uh, Dr. Oladeji. This is such an important issue and perhaps one of the major neglected areas within health um, in lower and middle income countries, as you highlighted with even the workforce and the, the small number of of experts uh, that are able to help, but it's a problem throughout. Now, I'd like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Angelo Niemtema, who will be joining us from Tanzania. Dr. Niemtema is a consultant and senior 
lecturer in obstetrics and gynecology at St. Francis University College of Health and Allied Sciences, and the Tanzanian Training Center for International Health in Ifakara, Tanzania. Um, so I, I've known Dr. Um, uh, Niam Tema for many years now. We've, we've, we've uh, both been involved as principal and co-principal investigators on our project, and I can attest to him being uh, an excellent um, uh, gynecologist and obstetrician and a very well-trained uh, uh, scientist who has worked very hard to make sure that we achieve um, uh, the objectives of our program. Dr. Niam Tema will focus on the importance of leadership and management of support um, uh, in uh, leading to improved quality of maternal and newborn care. Um, so Dr. Niam Tema, the floor is yours. Thank you, John, for the invitation. And I would like us to take this opportunity to really thank the organizers for um, allowing me to present on behalf of my colleagues, John and the others. Of course, here we have quite a number of co-investigators. Um, I've seen them, so uh, we are really happy to present and share with you what we, uh, we, we found uh, when we were implementing uh, the two image projects. I wanted to start by saying that we we had two projects um, that were supported by the IMCHA initiative. One was um, actually intended to scale up uh, comprehensive emergency obstetric and neonatal care services, particularly in rural areas. So uh, the second one, which was um, a synergy project, uh, this is what I'm going to present, was, uh, was actually on the capacity building for, uh, capacity building for leadership and managerial uh, for, for, for health managers in order to improve the quality of care, uh, particularly for maternal and uh, neonatal uh, services. Next slide, please. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to discuss actually uh, the, I think I've already mentioned about the, the team members, um, included John, Gary, uh, quite a number of uh, investigators out here and others from Tanzania. And uh, yeah, they were involved in this research. Next slide. When talking about the significance of leadership and management, uh, our former president, Julius Nyerere, who was actually one of the most influential former presidents in Africa, said that good leadership is one of the key success factors for social and uh, economic development. And uh, this is very important, actually. The key message, uh, key message that we get from this court uh, is that if you want to improve uh, social services, including uh, healthy services and economic uh, performances, then you need to improve leadership and the management. Next slide. So this is a key message uh, which is really very vital. I wanted to say that there is a very strong connection between leadership and management uh, with other block, uh, block, uh, building blocks. His Excellency uh, Dr. Mboki mentioned about the six uh, World Health Organization uh, building blocks. But it's really very important to know that uh, in order to have health workforce functioning, and the good supplies, monitoring of the services, having information and the utilization, the health financing, you need effective leadership. So there is a very strong connection between leadership, governance and management with all these uh, rocks. Next slide. So, we knew this in advance uh, about the importance of um, uh, leadership and the management. 
And so we designed a project that was meant to do the capacity, or strengthen the capacity um, in this uh, in leadership and management uh, in order to improve the quality of pregnancy and uh, newborn outcomes in Tanzania. So this study was done uh, from 2017 to 2021. We have not closed the, the project yet. And the key findings that we found uh, were one was the fact that majority of health managers at uh, the level of the facility, but even the, the council, the district health management teams, and even the regional health management teams, a large number of them, majority of them, uh, are not trained or have been less trained in leadership and management. And so there is a gap, a very serious gap in management. And this is because the pre-services, some of the pre-services the universities do not address leadership and management. So it's like a forgotten component and the pre-service uh, curriculum. But the other thing is that we had also to, to audit the pregnancy outcomes. Talk about the maternal death, the prenatal death, the severe morbidities. And we could see that uh, um, almost 65 percent of maternal death were contributed to poor or ineffective leadership and management. You, you can talk about uh, human resource management, the absenteeism of care providers, absence of resources, not because of poverty, but just because of poor mobilization of resources and the poor utilization of the resources. So we concluded by saying that leadership is one of the most needed uh, focus areas that we need to strengthen actually uh, in our systems. And uh, we have weak systems but they can be improved by building the capacity in this area of leadership and management. Next slide. We, we, we just want to really emphasize on the importance of leadership and management. A report which was uh, given by the World Bank in 2003, it was for a study which was done in various countries in the world, including two African countries, Egypt and Zimbabwe, but there are other countries in Latin America, I think South Africa, South America, and that was Bolivia and uh, other countries in Asia. So they, come up, they came up with their statement saying that when maternal and child intervention leads to improved quality of obstetric and newborn care, the success has been attributed to strong leadership in the reproductive health. So you can see differences uh, in terms of the maternal mortality ratios, but even within the, the countries with the same uh, economic power. And uh, so what would be the difference then if you have uh, countries with the same economic power and yet with the significant differences in terms of the maternal mortality ratio. It's just because of the problem with the leadership and management. So it's really very important to make sure that we strengthen leadership and management if we want to improve the quality of the services uh, uh, in our health systems. Next slide, please. And uh, I wanted to conclude by saying that rebuilding an effective and uh, efficient health system, leadership and the management represent a hub of all other building. And this is what I've been emphasizing actually since I started uh, presenting here. So it's very important that, and that is what we, we have seen when we were conducting our project that, uh, in fact, we wanted to, to, to strengthen and uh, uh, yeah, support uh, 
strengthening its uh, comprehensive emergence of such care services. But we came out to realize that we needed also to strengthen leadership and management. And uh, it's a matter of fact, you cannot, you cannot just strengthen one component and leave alone leadership and management. So it's, it's, it's a hub of all other building blocks uh, which we need to address. It's very unfortunate, and this is my last comment, that most of the interventions actually are disease specific, and we are very, have very few uh, interventions which are addressing leadership and management. So thank you very much, and I would like to thank also the organizer, uh, organizers and the, the funders of our projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Niamhima, and I'm so glad you mentioned that emphasis that most of our interventions are actually based on diseases, uh, some integrated models, but not nearly enough on, on the human resources side of things, so that's a very welcome comment. Lastly, I'd like to welcome Dr. Heather Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott is an uh, uh, obstetrician gynecologist and maternal fetal, sorry, <laughs> maternal fetal medicine self-specialist. I shouldn't have trouble with the word fetal as a pediatrician. <laughs> Uh, and Chief of Obstetrics at the IWK Health Center in Halifax, and she's an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Medicine and the Director of the Global Health Unit, um, and she is also the Chief of the uh, Department of Obstetrics and, and Gynecology. I think I already said that. <laughs> uh, and anyway, Dr. Scott is with, in, with our project, and she's been a wonderful partner with that. She, she has a wealth of experience in dealing with um, data in in several settings, high income and low income settings, and how that's critical to our understanding of uh, uh, the impact of, uh, of our functioning of our health system, which is very much, uh, the data systems are very much like the nervous system and they have to allow all parts of the health system to communicate. So Dr. Scott, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, John. I really um, appreciate the opportunity to contribute to this conversation. Um, if I could have my slides up, please. Great. Um, so my my job here is to uh, quite quickly, because I know that we're running a little bit behind, talk about how we can actually use the data that we collect um, in these research projects to improve the quality of care that we're actually providing. Um, everybody has um, uh, spoken about this in one way or another about taking the, the knowledge and translating it into action. And it's also been uh, brought up how we um, uh, then can use that um, information through monitoring and evaluation to, to hopefully um, uh, improve uh, the end result. Um, next slide, please. And there are many examples in maternal and perinatal health about how we use the data um, uh, to monitor and, and improve outcomes. And some of those examples would be um, uh, ones that have already been raised in terms of maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. But we can also use this data to look at other outcomes, important outcomes, induction of labor, operative vaginal delivery, um, support in labor, uh, whether or not there's a skilled attendant at birth, um, number of antenatal visits and screening uh, during pregnancy, um, and also um, monitoring cesarean sections. And I'm going to focus, use uh, cesarean sections as a little bit of an example of, um, of use of data to try to improve uh, outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit of background, and we, we this is a place to start. It's a, a data place uh, to start. Um, we know that the lifetime risk of dying from a pregnancy-related complication is very high in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's about 1 in 39. And if we compare that to high-resource countries, um, uh, it's significantly different, um, uh, with it being about 1 in 3,800 in uh, high-resource countries. And et il y a eu, de par le monde, des efforts visant à surveiller la mortalité maternelle et à utiliser cette information pour améliorer les résultats. Mais de plus en plus, on a déployé des efforts pour surveiller et optimiser les taux de césariennes. Les césariennes, nous le savons, peuvent sauver la vie des mères et des bébés, des enfants. Mais nous savons aussi qu'il y a eu une augmentation continue euh, du taux d'intervention par césarienne à l'échelle mondiale. Et cela n'a pas forcément été accompagné par une amélioration sensible des bienfaits, des résultats 
pour les mères et les nouveau-nés. Il semble qu'il y a un seuil au-delà duquel la mortalité néonatale et maternelle est That's sort of sweet spot um, that's one of our challenges. Next slide please. Um, but we, we still don't have an optimal cesarean section rate um, uh, known. There's a huge variation worldwide. So um, uh, it's about 7.3% in um, Africa overall and about 40.5% in Latin America and the Caribbean. So a, a tremendous variation. Um, there was a statement that was released by the WHO in 2015, um, and previously they'd given a rate of 10 to 15 percent as being optimal. They then uh, did a, um, a systematic review of information and concluded that cesarean section rates higher than 10 percent are not associated with the reduction in rates in perinatal mortality and uh, uh, maternal mortality. Um, but that data was still incomplete in that it didn't really talk about morbidity or long-term perinatal, uh, long-term pediatric outcomes, nor did it focus on stillbirths or psychosocial outcomes. So um, knowing that optimal cesarean section rate is, uh, is still somewhat elusive. Next slide, please. This is really just to, to demonstrate the wide variation. So if you look at the um, uh, both light and dark orange, um, those are high rates of cesarean section and are generally higher than 25%. If you look, on the other hand, at the light blue, light blue, which we see more in Africa, is less than 5%. And a disconcerting um, area there are the, uh, the gray parts um, where data is not actually available. So um, we have a whole range of, of data that um, uh, is available to us to inform us about cesarean sections globally, um, but some of it is actually missing. Next slide, please. Um, in 2008, the WHO came up with some recommendations about non-clinical interventions to reduce unnecessary cesarean sections. Um, and just to highlight a package here from what they, they suggested in that, they said that the implementation of evidence-based practice guidelines was really important, um, uh, paired with C-section audits and timely feedback to healthcare professionals. Um, they recommended on-site training in, in evidence-based clinical practices so that people understood why they were, um, why certain recommendations were being made. Um, uh, that guideline said that um, uh, we needed to um, uh, um, facilitate implementation by local opinion leaders, that local audits providing feedback to providers and, and uh, decision makers were important. Um, and then interestingly said that the risks of cesarean section are higher in women with limited access to comprehensive obstetrical care and therefore careful consideration is required in settings limited by expertise and facilities, which means that one size does not fit all. Unfortunately, some of the recommendations that we would make regarding cesarean section don't necessarily apply to um, everybody. Next slide, please. Um, one of the ways that we have used data to help guide cesarean sections um, is something called um, Robson classification. And this is a global standard for assessing, monitoring, and comparing cesarean section rates within and between health facilities and health regions. And Robson divided all women up into 10 groups using six obstetrical characteristics. So parity, number of fetuses, previous cesarean section, onset of labor, gestational age and fetal presentation. And by dividing women into these groups, we can then analyze the contribution of each group and assess strategies in order to optimize cesarean section rates within that group. So for example, Robson group one is low risk, spontaneous labor, singleton pregnancy, uh, cephalic presentation at 37 uh, weeks to 42. And if we have a high cesarean section rate in that low risk group, we can drill down on that and try to determine why that might be. Use of this data also allows us to assess the quality of the data collected and work to um, improve that. Next slide, please. So of course there are challenges when we try to use health data and that's challenges that we experience regardless of um, uh, what setting we work in. Um, but what we need to recognize is that studies done in high resource settings do not always apply to low resource settings and vice versa. 
but accurate, and, and we also need to, to, to know that um, accurate and consistent data collection um, can be very challenging, regardless of, of where it is that we're working. Knowledge translation, ongoing audit, um, review and mentorship um, can all be uh, very difficult to sustain if it was initiated through um, uh, specific funding. And if that funding is no longer available, how do we sustain these activities? What we also know is that data alone does not always tell the story. So you may have a high cesarean section rate um, in a low risk population, but um, the reasons for that are not necessarily clear from just looking at that rate alone. You need to be able to drill down into it and determine what factors are influencing that. Review of health data can be very intimidating for care providers, um, and they, they can have concerns about potential ramifications, particularly when you're looking at things like uh, severe maternal morbidity and mortality um, that they worry about, even things like uh, medical legal um, repercussions. So we have to be careful when we um, uh, talk about um, uh, data with uh, care providers. And, and finally, personal bias may run contrary to evidence-based practices. So trying to um, help people understand what is meant by an evidence-based um, change in practice and why uh, that uh, would be um, beneficial can sometimes be uh, challenging. Next slide, please. So what have we learned? Well, I know that from the work that I've done with um, uh, Dr. Nayan Tema and others, that it really is a co-learning model. So there are many lessons that we learn in high and low resource uh, settings that um, uh, can be used bilaterally to improve care. And one of the things that I've learned is that low resource settings, um, particularly as we think of this in the context of, uh, low, of, of um, cesarean section rapes, may have the opportunity to achieve more favorable outcomes and reverse already established trends um, uh, um, elsewhere. So starting at a, at, a, at a different level and using knowledge that's already been acquired um, and developing a new knowledge base may allow them to um, uh, uh, implement practices which are, are better than are being used elsewhere. We know that the evidence suggests that support and mentorship with the identification of champions is, is really, really uh, critical. Um, uh, so I think that's something that we've, we've learned from um, our partners um, uh, in Africa as well. And local um, support and buy-in is really essential um, and very difficult to quantify. Um, and then finally, high quality data is really is really critical for us to assess how we how we're doing, and not all that easy to obtain. Um, uh, so we need to continue with those efforts and to recognize that we need to look beyond uh, the data. And finally, innovation is, is possible. And I think that um, working with uh, our partners in other parts of the world uh, means that we can take those innovative practices that we've learned elsewhere and apply to our own um, health setting. Um, and moving away from some of the established norms that are potentially not necessarily best practice um, can be a very good thing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was really a great, uh, great overview and, and, and important lessons for both settings and as we, we learned in our work in Tanzania. Um, I would now like to take it to our um, question and answer period so people have the opportunity to put in uh, questions. We will have to cut this short because we are running behind. I, we're doing superbly in terms of all the wonderful presentations, but um, we are a little bit behind our schedule and we do have to finish on time. So I think we will just take um, uh, no more than five minutes for the Q&A. Um, and I will start off by the first question that I see. Um, I don't know if the, if the rest of you can see it. It has just popped up on my screen, but here it is. Um, so this is a question for Dr. Nyondo. Um, we've had difficulty collecting data on stillbirths and newborns in Tanzania because those data were often added to the partograph and there was no separate record for newborns. So what's the situation in Malawi and, and what would you recommend health systems to do, do to make sure that we know more about what happens to newborns and stillbirths? Should I go ahead and answer that? So... What's happening in Malawi is that uh, they've had to, because 
initially you would understand there wasn't anything about neonates. They've had to, uh, what's happening in Malawi is that they've had to have registers that are there to capture data for, for neonates and stillbirth. Of course, some of them that are the ones that occur at home because of the cultural aspects uh, where a neonate is not regarded that much would be missed. But then there are neonatal registers and currently there are neonatal audits, death audits that, that also happen. So I would, I would emphasize on having a register that captures that. And that register should start off from the primary level to the district level to the to the tertiary level so that at every point of data of <laughs> interface with the health system, that register is there and that data is captured. Thank you. That's excellent, thank you. Um, next, I will direct a question to Dr. Olada J. Um, this is very important work and we know that mental illness is a major issue and it's often a neglected and maligned one. I'm just wondering in your work over the course of the project, can you comment at all about have there been any changes in the sense of stigma uh, with respect to mental health and uh, both among families and health professionals? Okay, a uh, um, very great question. And then I would like to say that because our project was focused um, on improving the attitudes of um, providers towards providing care. So to, by, by the time we had gone through this work and the providers were more willing to see women with perinatal depression because they had the better understanding that these patients were not just um, giving them trouble in the clinic. It was because they had an illness that they could take care, take care of. And this was actually um, very much pronounced in our adolescent project. Before the start of the project, adolescents with, preg um, with pregnant adolescents generally were not really that very welcome in the clinic. And a lot of them had a lot of issues, neglect from their families and all that. And by the end of our program, the primary care providers were much more receptive to the adolescents. And then the adolescents also acknowledged that the providers had really helped them a lot in terms of um, helping them take care of depression and also negotiating their life issues. So it made a significant impact on stigma, especially in terms of wanting to seek care. That is excellent, thank you. Perhaps at this time, we will, unfortunately, we are gonna to have to close down this part of the presentation. It's, uh, it would, uh, we would love to continue, but we need to break out into um, our breakout groups. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all had fruitful dis discussions. I was in a group and really enjoyed talking to people from the various parts of the world about um, uh, the issues. We now have a few minutes to find out some key messages uh, from each of the groups so that the plenary can get some idea of what the other groups were uh, involved in. And I'm gonna call them in sequence. The first will be group one, and I'm asking Dr. Neem Tema to report back on uh, what his group uh, brings back to us. Thank you, John, for, uh, for, for this opportunity. And uh, we had a very um, good session, actually, with the uh, discussants and the course on education and the training, um, the role of formal education in the professional development for strengthening health care workers' capacities to provide quality services. Um, there are key uh, points that we actually noted that uh, uh, in some countries, particularly in Africa, we still have low competencies uh, among the care providers, and there are gaps actually in the training institutions related to the uh, structure, process, and uh, systems actually, which are involved in the training process. So um, the discussants uh, recommended a strengthening of the competency-based education training curriculum. Uh, by various ways, including use of the clinical skills lab, use of simulation to make sure that they acquire the required skills before they go and they practice independently. But um, uh, we also discussed about the role of accreditation um, for continuous medical education. Uh, and we found that uh, in some places, yes, we have well-established policies on that, and but in other places, this one is practicing some only a few professionals, and um, yeah, others do not have that kind of uh, uh, practice. 
But we also found that there is also a need of using the technology, um, like the e-learning, using of the e-health strategies to make sure that we strengthen their skills and the skills and the knowledge of the providers. That now that the technology is advancing um, in most countries, even in Africa, uh, uh, we consider it to be an opportunity actually for capacity building of the care providers. So these are the, some of the things we discussed in our breakout session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and just to remind everybody, we will have a record of all of these and it, it will be uh, written down. We had note takers for each group, so I appreciate that, Angelo. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from group two and either Marsha or Zubia. Uh, could you report back on your group, please? Sorry. Yeah, Zubia. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. Zubia here. Sorry, I was muted. I didn't realize it. And, and good to see you again, John. It's been a while. So our group talked about, um, we, we, our focus was on quality of care. And uh, um, we, we, about, we, we discussed three main topics. Well, I was asked to discuss, to share only three topics. So the first topic that we discussed was how can we promote a culture of a quality of care culture. And uh, our, our, our um, colleagues from Jamaica shared uh, with us some an initiative that the Ministry of Health in Jamaica launched in response to patient complaints about uh, poor patient provider interactions and how, you know, better communication would be better communication, better empathy would be more helpful. So we discussed about how we our findings from Malawi also pointed to the same thing and how the culture of uh, uh, the quality of care culture was dependent upon um, resources that were available and how a lack of resources normalized poor quality of care. The second topic that we discussed was how can we improve the implementation of quality improvement initiatives. So a key challenge is that our initiative is launched um, and it, lo it goes on for four or five years. And then once the funding stops, uh, the initiative comes to an end. It just doesn't pick its momentum. And uh, in other words, people use the word language of, language of sustainability. So uh, uh, our colleagues from Canada shared examples on how they, 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 there were some ex initiatives on how can we improve sustainability by providing a spoke and hub method of training so there could be continuous training. Uh, we also discussed the role of global health funding structures and how the funding structures which promote projectis, projects and this whole thing of projectism and projectitis so that a funding, it, it's just the funding structure forces people to work in a short period of time, which doesn't promote sustainability. Uh, uh, the third thing that we talked about was how can we learn from Canada? That Canada has done an excellent job of improving its maternal and child health. And what is it? what does it do that uh, makes it so successful? So our colleagues talked about that one of, the, one of the things they talked about was how there's a national program on neonatal health and that uh, groups get together, they benchmark health indicators, and then identify the best and learn from those groups. So the other thing they do is they focus on one thing at a time. They identify one issue, they work on it for, for example, a year, and then the teams get together and at the national level, and they learn from each other. And it is this uh, celebrating of successes and learning from failures and, you know, leaving behind your hierarchies and egos that is very helpful in promoting learning and improving the quality of care. So really some of these things need to be entrenched to promote, to produce that culture of high quality care. Thank you. Thank you, Zubia. Some very important insights and things that uh, you know, we, we Canadians can learn from as well. Room for more discussion there for sure. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, ask um, Annette Elliott Rose to um, bring back thoughts from her group with health system strengthening and health information systems. 
Yeah, thanks so much, John. We had a great discussion, uh, learning a lot from each other about what's working well, but also uh, some uh, significant gaps in health information systems uh, to, to inform change. Uh, several of the participants mentioned the need to include indicators for mental health, indicators for social determinants of health, uh, indicators that really look at the lives of women and children and to understand the complexity of their lives and, um, and, and not to be taking information from other systems about adult services because there is information unique to the lives of women and children that are important to inform service and care. Um, that uh, to that point that systems should gather information that respect and honor differences and, and also uh, really attend to that complexity. Lots of uh, a conversation around the rudimentary nature of a lot of information systems, the disconnect between information systems, both in African countries and in Canada, where we don't have linkages between systems, they're not coordinated, they don't speak to each other, um, and, and oftentimes there is gaps, there are gaps in information. Um, in some countries like Zambia, they do tally sheets at the community level and then they feed that information up. Sometimes that information sits with the, with the hospitals and then isn't coordinated and, and assembled in a way that uh, informs system change. And in some, uh, some uh, settings and including in Canada, information is facility based. So like women are giving birth in community. They don't have the information around that. And, um, and they've found really that COVID has complicated things significantly because we're not getting the information from communities. People are also hesitant to travel into hospitals for care. And so they're, they're not getting the information around what's happening. So lots of good things happening, but also opportunities for synergy. Thank you. Excellent, Annette. Lots of lessons learned there. Um, and finally, I'm going to ask um, Ermel to talk about group four, which was dealing with um, health systems and, and uh, uh, health systems preparedness. And I think, Ermel, did you want me to do that? Did you ask me to do okay, that? Okay, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lenny. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. So we too had a wonderful discussion, people with experience from different places in Africa as well as Asia. Uh, so uh, lots of learning. So we were looking at uh, health systems preparedness. And um, the first idea we talked about was changing the paradigm from bringing healthcare to the community to empowering communities to identify their own needs and address them. And that as important as governments are in the whole uh, healthcare delivery system, this strength of the system itself directed from the government uh, and the major administrations must be balanced by empowering communities. And so we talked about how you, some experiences that have uh, identified how to empower communities. One is that um, to listen to the contextual factors in each community, even within an own region, there may be contextual factors that you don't identify. And that unless you disaggregate, even at the community level, you may not find them. So for example, uh, uh, there was one example given of a community where overall the maternal health policies improved the quantitative measures, but when you disaggregated it by caste, there were certain parts of the community that were not improving. So one part was driving the overall measurement. So you very much have to be aware of the sub-communities within each uh, group that you're measuring. We, uh, so gender and equity might not be uh, captured if you look at the overall, even community level. Um, we looked at uh, the, what, what happens when you empower people at the ground level, people who are taking those short courses to be primary healthcare workers, that is not enough. They have this hunger for more learning. And they're like gems that are hidden. And once you find those gems, it's not enough. They need ongoing training and they want this training. And the example was given in a community where people who are teaching to hand wash, 
But that's, then they teach their community about hand wash. They want to know why hand washing makes a difference. What's the pathophysiology of hand washing? What's the scientific basis, the evidence? So there's this ongoing need um, to continue to develop those skills that empower people. And they will bring people along with them. Um, an example was given of, of governments recognizing this need for ongoing leadership and capacity assessment. And I think Tanzania is doing that where there's an, a contact between the central government and the communities where there are visits that go um, are made to the periphery and um, uh, assessments are made and it's a continuous relationship and building of relationships. And, there's, it was a very rich discussion, but perhaps I'll close with this uh, last note that the capacity that was built during these IMSHA projects was recognized when COVID happened. And the people who were being trained and had developed all these community models were able to both pivot and leverage existing uh, relationships and capacity to deal with this new threat to health. Um, and so uh, they very much recognize the value of everything that's been done in your, your projects. So thanks very much. That's excellent. And thank you to all four groups to the excellent uh, feedback that we have. That will be good uh, things to discuss further. We're a few minutes ahead. I'm, I'm just going to give uh, any of the speakers that reported back Another opportunity for a minute or two if they would like to address um, any of the points that the other participants raised or if there was a point that they wish they had made that they hadn't, uh, the, that they didn't feel they had time to make. Um, so just for a minute or two, do anything, do any of you have anything further you would like to add about lessons learned? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> that we had a very good feedback, and uh, and that's great. All right, so um, folks, it's we're coming to the end of this. It's um, uh, it's been a superb uh, exchange of ideas and the ability to uh, um, for everyone to um, participate. And there will be a document that comes out of that that summarizes some of the key learnings that we will distribute. And we have now moved on to the. Um, uh, closing. Oh, sorry. There are some some Slido things. So um, let me just check. Am I supposed to reply back on what people are saying? You should be seeing some questions. Um, Hi, John. Hi. This is Marie, if I may. Um, just to invite all our participants um, to go back to the Slido. There are some more questions there. Um, to uh, respond uh, on, on how this event was for you to help us plan for future events. Uh, we will not show the, the results uh, right now. We will move into our closing remarks, but um, before you leave, please make sure to uh, go and answer these few questions. Thank you. All right, good to know. So I won't have to report back. Uh, all right, so what, are, what we will be moving on to now are the closing remarks. And uh, first, I would like to introduce Dr. John Dusave Richards uh, Director of Global Health Division at IDRC for his closing remarks. Dr. Giuseppe Richards. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Bonjour, everyone. It's my Hello, everyone. part of this event on behalf of IMCHA. Today, we have dived into the health system's work to improve uh, maternal and child health. As you have learned, immature teams strengthened the health systems in different ways. Some teams tasted ways to strengthen the capacities of the health workforce. Some supported uh, quality improvement initiatives. Some used innovations and new technologies, such as simulation training and digital storytelling. Others, tested task shifting and integrated service delivery models. And great results are coming out of this work in mental health, in prenatal care and others. In the IDRC's Global Health Division, our mandate is to strengthen health systems and policies so that they can deliver better maternal and child health, improved sexual and reproductive health and rights for women and girls and more effective and equitable preparedness and responsive 
responses to um, epidemics. IMCHA's successes shared here today illustrate our approach to global health, port implementation research and innovations that improve the full range of women's sexual and reproductive health that respond to epidemics in a vision of strong health systems. We engage with and support linkages between researchers and decision makers to foster greater uptake of research findings in the countries where our research takes place. Our view is that evidence is key to reverse the structural inequalities that compromise women's and girls' health. So today we have learned about good practices in service delivery models and how task shifting at primary health care has improved access to services. In Nigeria, for example, research teams presented how they integrated the health services at the primary health care levels. This had led to improved recovery rates from perinatal depression in 32 clinics in Oyo State. We have learned that the health workforce is the backbone of the health system, that capacity strengthening in both clinical skills as well as leadership and managerial skills is crucial. An example in Tanzania, the research team discussed how e-learning for the comprehensive emergency obstetric and neonatal care has led to more than doubling of the number of women having deliveries in the equipped health facilities. IMCHA research team supported the council's health management teams in strengthening their leadership and management skills. This has reflected positively on the performance of the council health management teams in these areas and the overall health system performance. Moreover, health information systems are key for sound decision-making and health planning, as we have seen here today. In Ethiopia, an image team supported the civil registration and vital statistics agency in the country to collect data on the causes of death. The team used uh, extremely uh, technical tools to understand the causes of maternal and infant mortality high rates. This coordination has helped Ministry of Health and Statistics Department to strengthen their data systems for routine monitoring in the future. But one cannot help uh, one cannot help but reflect on how important these lessons are during COVID-19. Strengthening health systems is needed now more than ever. Public health systems globally are struggling to prepare for, detect and manage pandemics like COVID-19. Persistent structural and systemic inequalities and lack of policies and resources make it difficult to maintain essential health services. That's why IDRC, in our new 10-year strategy, will examine gaps in epidemic preparedness and support gender-inclusive approaches to strengthen health systems and community responses to epidemics in the developing world. Our research investments will strengthen the integration of health research and public health systems to enhance epidemic prevention and response. We will continue today's conversation. We are planning more IMCHA webinars and events in the coming months. Please stay tuned by looking on our website, subscribe to our social media newsletter, follow us on, on Twitter and Facebook. I hope this event has reflected on the good practices of IMCHA research projects and the lessons learned for strengthening the health systems to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and other emergencies. I would like to thank the organizing committee, Delhurst University and the colleagues at CIHR, the IMCHA management and research teams, and the health policy and research organizations in Africa. Congratulations and the good work. Thank you from me and the whole IDRC. Gra merci. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Dr. Savi Richards. And I must say the, the global health community 
in Canada and abroad very much values the work of IDRC in this important work. So we're looking for you to keep it going. <laughs> to, thank, you, know, thank you very much. Very important partner. Excellent. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Gail Tomlin Murphy. Um, she's the Vice President of Research, Innovation and Discovery uh, and the Chief Nurse Executive at the Nova Scotia Health Authority. She has also been for many years the Director of the WHO PAHO, that's Pan, Amer Pan African Health, sorry, Pan American Health Organization, Collaborating Center on Health Workforce Planning and Research. Uh, and, and Gail has been a co-principal uh, investigator with me on the synergy part of this grant, which has been about strengthening the leadership and management uh, uh, aspects of our of our work. So Gail, the floor Thank is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, and, and to all of you, it's been such a pleasure to see many of you and, and we look for the days where we can host you at, at in Halifax and, and I know we all long to, to get together. Uh, it, this has been just uh, incredible to hear the many lessons learned today and the accomplishments really through the IMSHA support on uh, advancing what we know around women and children's health as well as mental health. And I think that's already been outlined. But to hear the stories around equity from, from Malawi and from Tanzania and, and Nigeria and then with the Canadian uh, splash today as well, I think it would be fair to say that we are learning from each other how to strengthen our health systems and how to align them more with the needs of people. There's been so many uh, conversations where you've outlined what those challenges are. And, and in that regard, uh, how do those challenges actually, if we work at them together and advance them together, how we could strengthen overall our health systems. But it also points to the workforce. And I think we've heard that in terms of, of those gaps and finding ways to address those gaps. It's not always about numbers. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's about competencies and, and, and supporting people to work differently and to engage our partners and community partners as outlined in some of the comments in a very meaningful way. So we know that global health research is incredibly important and it's this critical evidence really that comes and guides us as we work together. And these are the cornerstones for the cross learnings that we have. And we see that we all will take back some of these learnings and, and put them to place in, in practice as well as policy and future research uh, to strengthen our health systems. And we know the WHO on many levels has talked about a framework, a fra framework that talks about multiple actions and multiple partners um, to work at this. We heard today about sustainability in partnerships and we need to be thinking about scaling and sustainability much earlier than when we just set out with funding to do projects. And uh, so we have to encourage this. And that talked and reported back on, on the health information systems. We've been talking about health information systems for a long time. What I've learned from my, my work in, in uh, many countries is that we don't have to wait to have the perfect health information system, but we need to figure out what are some of those proxies and how do we collect data. We heard some of that from Zambia in terms of tallying that information and feeding that up. That's incredibly important. We also heard and we all believe in and need to find ways to strengthen what we know about diversity, equity and inclusiveness and what this actually means to communities as, as Joanna had indicated and engaging them. And also the system needs to learn uh, more broadly from governments as well as from people and and, and we talked a lot about that today. We need to find ways to engage our healthcare providers, listen to them, learn from them, and include them in the research that we are doing and include them and our patients and our families in the ongoing monitoring of whether we are getting it where it needs to be or not. So the lessons learned have been incredible and, and we know what they are. And, and at the end of the day, we need to focus also on the leadership. We need to focus on governance frameworks where we have different levels of accountability and people have the tools to monitor whether they're moving towards the accountability or, or not and, and how we can help to, to correct things when we know that, that they're, they're not correct. So I'd like to leave you just with three quick points to consider as we go forward. As Canadians, we have learned a lot from our global health research um, our partnerships and, and projects, and it's through uh, INCHA and, and other, pro uh, other uh, partnerships that we've been able to do this. And we can learn ways to strengthen our, our system through engagement, as, as I've said, that the sustained partnerships are incredible. So we need to continue to work with each other. We need to find ways to go deep 
and, and to have the impact that we know we all wish to have. And so we need to be thinking about capacity building, best ways to do that and how to learn from, from each other. And the last comment, which I think that we've heard everybody say, it's not easy. Strengthening the health workforce is critical to, to strengthening the health system. COVID-19, as well as many other pandemics across the world, globally, historically, and in the future, I think have taught us some important lessons on how we will partner together, how we'll be using evidence together, and how we will just support each other and wrap our arms around each other when we're struggling. So thank you very much for this opportunity and to many of the partners who are here today and for the funding and the leadership from IMCHA. Thank you so much, Gail, for grounding us in the, the reality and the importance of making sure that we deal with leadership and, and the lessons learned in both directions also are so critically important. So thanks again and thanks for your participation. Uh, we are now at the end and it's time for me to um, say a few a few closing words and I don't want to say too much but I since we have a couple of minutes I'm just going to say a couple of things. I must say it's been it's been a wonderful experience. It's been an excellent illustration of the fact that we can learn from each other, um, that lessons are common. So too often uh, even within our health communities here in Canada, for example, we talk about, let's say, there's the global health part, there's the mental health part, there's the physical health part. Uh, we, we tend to silo things. If there's anything that, that COVID has taught us and I, that I hope will teach us as we go forward, it's that we really are part of a global community. I think people are becoming to appreciate more and more that, uh, that these uh, a, a crisis like COVID, which is actually compared to some of the crises that are coming like climate change, COVID is actually reasonably manageable. Um, uh, if, this, if that's taught us anything, it's that we must work together uh, beyond borders to solve some of these problems. Um, and it's been fascinating that not only in health, but in other areas like economics and business and government, people have realized that we can no longer do this alone, that it can't be one country doing it by itself. So I'm looking forward to a future where global health is seen not just kind of as a peripheral thing as part of a university's mandate or, or something that may not be so important to a provincial health system, which might see it as just a nice little add-on, but it really, it has to be seen as an integral part of what we do as we advance the health of um, uh, not only uh, mothers and babies that I'm particularly interested in as a pediatrician, but of, of all members of our society. So let us hope that uh, one of the big lessons from this last year is that global health really becomes much more of an integrated part of how we approach the various uh, challenge that, challenges that humanity faces. Um, I do want to thank, thank specifically the the organizing team. There, were, there was a lot of work that went into this um, uh, including participants that most of whom we've seen here, but I especially wanted to thank the people uh, that weren't quite as visible. There were a lot of people behind the scenes that, that uh, helped with this, particularly people at IDRC like Marie, whom you have seen, um, but also Francine um, and um, uh, Francine Sinzen Kayo. Uh, at our end, we had a lot of help from Janet Rigby, who works um, uh, for um, a Gale and has been a uh, also being very involved in our in our intro project and Alicia McVernock who has been a big help she's just come on recently she's a, uh, going to graduate school and she has been superb in helping do all the various things that need to be done um, collaborate video has been excellent I must say I didn't realize that a virtual conference could go so smoothly and I'm most impressed especially with the ability to do the translation so it actually makes it seem that, you know, these virtual conferences aren't so bad. We do like the face-to-face, -face, but but I think this has been a superb experience and I hope you agree that we've all um, uh, benefited from it and that there are lessons learned to be taken as we go forward. So folks, that's the end. We're at the end now and I hate to say it, but it's time to say bye-bye, bonsoir, khodafez whatever, Sinara. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, please take good care of yourselves and we will see you at some point in the future.